My name is Chris Fernland, and I am the manager of student support at eCampus Ontario, where I support the Student Experience Design Lab. Before I introduce the panel, I wanted to quickly say a few words about TESS. So TESS, from our perspective, is, is an opportunity for us to share back with our community and what we're up to and how we're trying to support colleges and universities within the province of Ontario. As well, the conference is an opportunity for eCampus Ontario to hear and learn from the post-secondary community so that we can attempt to collectively support the whole system together. I mean, I say all of this because I think of TESS as a place to learn and collaborate with the many key players within the post-secondary realm. For us, for us, students are our key players. At eCampus Ontario, we believe that in order to ensure teaching and learning practice are empathetic to the needs of the end users of education, we have to start by talking to them, by learning from learners what's working, what's not, and what could be better. Coincidentally, the theme of this year's test conference is humanizing the learning experience. So, and with me today are four super smart students who have all experienced the shift to teaching and learning. So let's learn from them. I'd like to introduce Shamal Gormish from Centennial College, who is studying hospitality and tourism. If you don't mind raising your hand, Shamal. Interestingly, Shamal is an international student from Turkey, and she also works with us in the SXD lab. We also have Malik Abu Rabia from Laurentian University, who is pursuing a Bachelor of Business Admin and also holds the title of Vice President of Education for the Laurentian Student University Association. We also have Ali Kazmi, who recently graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in History and Poli Sci. He also serves as a Graduate Research Assistant for OCAD University and also works with us in the SXD lab. And last but not least, we have Brad Dalglish, who is just finishing up a Bachelor of Science in Psychology with a minor in Buddhism and Mental Health. On top of Brad's studies, he acts as a peer mentor for students with accessibility needs. So welcome, everyone. So I wanted to kickstart this conversation by talking about some of the changes you've experienced so far. I mean, as we all know, 2020 has been a year. We are still in the midst of a global pandemic that has caused massive global disruption and has directly impacted your experience as a post-secondary learner. So broadly, what can you share with us about your experiences so far? What's different and what are some challenges you've all been facing? Malik. Yeah, so definitely working in the uh, post-secondary space and I'm pretty new to it myself. Um, no one could really expect uh, any of this. And go, even going back to the start of the pandemic when um, that was in March, midterm season, exam season is coming up, really big rush uh, and big change and, and so much stress going on for all levels of post-secondary education from students to faculty and staff and even IT. Uh, folk on campuses. And I think that transition was just really stressful and um, and incredibly important uh, because I think the uh, transition to to online learning has has been there, but it's been trekking very slowly. So it really went from that really snail's pace to to that uh, rabbit's pace. And I think that a lot of institutions were not ready for that. Um, especially with the uh, uh, lack of uh, online resources and the ratio from IT to um, faculty and professors. So it really was at a disadvantage for a lot of students, especially worst part being exam, exam time. Um, then obviously going into the summer, things are going back and, you know, a lot of still a lot of uncertainty. And now we're here in October and uh, it's still happening where it's like things are changing every day. There's not a lot of consistency as we see a, a second wave, especially. Um, and as we approach a, a, a winter semester, again, so much uncertainty for students either having to move back onto campus or to um, whether or not they even want to pursue post-secondary education in a time like this um, because of the external stress and costs and all sorts of reasons. Um, but I definitely think it is quite a difficult time for, for the entire, and, and it really a test for the whole uh, post-secondary space in Ontario. Thank you for sharing, Malik. Yeah, certainly. It's a, a giant pilot or experiment in, in working remotely for sure. Ali. 
One thing that I did see as I was taking workshops and classes that were in person is that during March when the lockdown did happen and then we were all transitioned to taking those same classes online, whereas, you know, they could have dragged on for maybe four to five hours in person, but that was manageable because we had a peer group around us and we could speak to our professors and our TAs face to face. And then when it came to doing it online, a lot of people had a tendency towards um, self-preservation and self, um, and just a bit of distancing from their from their peer group. Whether that is not being active on the mic, it's not being active on the webcam, and just going through the actual motion. So part participation did take a a a dip. Right, and that is stressful both for these these students who feel that they that they're not getting the most from their program, and also for the professors and and teachers who feel that they this is not the level of engagement that they're used to. Absolutely, absolutely, Brad. Yeah, just building off of what Ali said, um, working with the accessibility. I also have some accessibility needs myself, and I know it was such an abrupt shift overnight going from, um, I again, work with students with disabilities, and a lot of that uh, supporting that comes from the external environment to all of a sudden have to be at home um, pretty much 24 hours a day, and then also having to fit the academic tasks in and keep up on that. It was quite, quite difficult, and as well as what Ali was saying, the engagement factor was really different. and. Um, I had a summer course that I went to and we had about 40 students and there was only about three students that would show up every week. So I know for um, some of us, like going to those classroom environments, the professor did a great job just in terms of um, she uh, opened up our ability for us to discuss like what we could do to make it better. And we voted to go asynchronous and then have a discussion period. And it was really neat. Uh, I made the request to do discussion questions. And literally the week after that, the next class, she had discussion questions posted. So we had actually a really great conversation throughout the summer based on these discussion questions. And otherwise, I think it would have been just a really quick check-in where people would have, uh, again, asked their question and laugh, but it kind of provided the opportunity to discuss. So thank you, Brad, for, for sharing, especially being honest about your accessibility needs. I mean, kind of a question I have for you specifically do you feel supported by your institution um, in terms of accessibility needs? I mean, it's a whole different ball game in terms of accessibility requirements in a remote teaching and learning setting. I mean, how do you feel about all of this? How has it been working for you, I suppose? That's that's a really interesting question. Um, my role now with accessibility is actually in facilitating some um, learning workshops, which has been really great and to see a kind of engagement increase in that. In terms of um, some of the accommodations, it, it, it's quite similar in terms of the um, test and exam accommodations have been carried forward. And I do feel that there is a lot of, um, not even just for students with accessibility needs, I think there's been a lot of understanding in the university environment and professors being a little bit more flexible, realizing that people have multiple things going on. And even realizing um, in February when that transition happened, I was able to connect with a few professors who uh, extend kind of the due date collectively for the class. No, that's that's really, thank you for shining a, a light on that perspective. Appreciate that, Brad. Shamal, do you want to add some comments on the original question? So we're just curious, like what's what's different for you and what are some challenges you've all been facing? Yeah, uh, so definitely um, peer to peer interaction has been affected for sure. Um, group works have become more challenging, you know, group assignments and, you know, discussions, et cetera, et cetera, has definitely gotten really, really challenging over the course of this whole quarantine. Um, what I see, um, the difference that I see, like, between, like, the March, like, the last semester when this whole thing just, like, abruptly happened, professors didn't know how to, like, uh, better transition to an online education system right away. Uh, but right now with the, with the new fall semester, I feel like professors are uh, a lot more prepared as well as students. So classes go through more smoothly, more planned out, which is good. And um, the other thing is like, I think it was a good factor for most of the students that were in Centennial College. 
uh, it was that uh, commuting, the, the fact that like we have to commute to school for hours on end was something that took out uh, a big chunk of our time. So not having to commute has been affecting me and my classmates in a good way because that way we're able to, you know, actually spend more time on uh, like school works, personal works, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, it's been uh, good that like some more planned out, more like better structured education system has helped um, just better plan our lives in many different aspects. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing. I mean, something I have heard anecdotally from multiple students is that they are actually very happy with remote teaching. I mean, for some of them, it's the asynchronous aspect that is appealing as it means they have more freedom to adjust their learning schedule and to accommodate their work commitments and or personal time. And we all have likely heard the pop psychology joke that this new environment is an introvert's dream. <laughs> but I'm curious, uh, how do you all feel about learning remotely? How is it working for you? Do you prefer it, if you don't mind me asking? Shamal, your hands up. Um, yeah, so there are definitely certain parts that I really enjoy. Like I said, I don't have to commute for an hour to school. Um, so it gives me a lot of time to like actually work on myself. Um, and then the other thing is that um, the asynchronous part of the whole online education is very, very helpful for me. Um, I don't think I can be considered an introvert, but I'm definitely, I definitely prefer, you know, working on my individual assignments rather than group work. Um, so that has been very, very helpful for me. I'm just able to like focus whatever I need to focus. Um, but the, the challenging part is that like you need to sort of make some, you know, workspace for yourself in your comfort zone. And that is the hardest part for me for now. Um, it's hard to like keep yourself, you know, not distracted when you're at home, like pretty much all the time. Um, you're just like switching from one corner of the room to the other, uh, working and then studying, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it definitely has been an interesting experience. Some of my lectures have been uh, shortened um, by like a couple hours because nobody wants to sit through um, like a laptop or like any other screen for like three, four hours. Uh, professors included. Um, so that's why it's been good in a way that like I spend less time in school right now and that it helps me uh, focus more on my school assignments, my homeworks and my other things that I'm like focusing on right now. So it's like it has been a much needed like sort of like space and like a, a freed up chunk of time for me personally. So um but it is definitely still challenging when it comes to, you know, group works uh, or, you know, reaching out to other students for whatever needs that I might have. Um, so, yeah, it's good and bad at the same time, I guess. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting that self-discipline is definitely a requirement and, and a new challenge and a, and a new opportunity, I guess, to, to learn based on a learn by doing approach. <laughs> Ali, your virtual hand is raised. Thanks, Chris. One thing that I did notice that um, just just about learning and going to school and just work habits pre-pandemic was that um, when I was doing my uh, two-hour trip to the downtown core, there were many um, perks and many drawbacks to that. On one hand, I was much more active. I was getting my 10,000 steps per day. I was going into um, into stores and, and making friends with store owners. It was a it was a much more balanced life. And now what I'm feeling is that while yes, it it is pretty cool to you know stay at home and be able to take care of the of the dog and be able to you know help my my parents more. On the other hand, there seems to be a big for me personally, a big reshuffling of priorities. Whereas before I was really into having that like balanced life where I was able to go out and socialize and, and really keep up with that part of my life. Now it's just that I'm seeing this as both a a very like, like it's 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 time to really work on myself and and for me that means piling on as much work as possible, working as with, with as many people as possible and just to you know really just um 
And I think part of that is just due to the uncertainty, the uncertainty of the time. So for me, my reflexive response to all of this is just to keep working. And, you know, if other parts of my life fall, like if they fall behind, then so be it. Thank you for sharing, Ali. I admittedly want to put you on the spot, Malik, and kind of ask you a two-part question. I mean, I'm very curious to know how it's working for you personally, but I'm also aware that you are at Laurentian University up in the north. So I'm very curious to know if you've experienced any personal challenges with maybe broadband access or anything of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. So even be, even before I answer that question, like I think Ali brought up some really great points about that balanced lifestyle that students are really, really used to. So I'm a business student and, you know, at the end of the day, the, the marks is not the biggest piece for a business student. It's the networking. And I think we really miss that. We miss just meeting some, you know, really interesting and random people on campus and exchanging those business cards and shaking people's hands and, and being very social. It's the whole reason why I work in the space I do. So that's definitely something I, I personally miss. And even with students, I, I find that that do work a lot or, or those people on campus that do work a lot, sitting in a physical lecture is that one or two or three hour time period where they can really just sit down and learn, which I find with the synchronous learning, I'm not getting as much. Uh, and especially, you know, with those long chapters and those big textbooks, so we have to read. It's not, it's not, it's really not the same experience, although it works for some people that doesn't work for, for myself personally, but it is what it is we're managing. But although b- business is really somewhat uh, a simple transition from, from, you know, in person to online, but I do feel for those STEM and, and engineering and architecture uh, uh, groups that have a lot harder time transitioning to that online space, especially with the amount of, uh, of um, in-person work integrated learning opportunities and just the amount of software that they need that they could access on campus that they now need to buy at home. Uh, so I think that universities need to be conscious of, of that. But then just to, add, to um, just answer your uh, question about broadband. So yeah, I live in Sudbury, but I actually spent a lot of time on Manitoulin Island on the su- in the summer where notoriously the broadband is horrible. There's barely even any cellular connection where I was at. So doing a lot of my summer courses was virtually impossible for a lot of the time or a really big headache. I remember doing my exam up there and I was just really freaking out that it would cut out halfway through. And luckily it didn't, but could have gone anyway. But I think a lot of students that are in these Northern institutions are in that same boat where they either are the first person in their family to go to post to pursue post-secondary education, or they go because it is accessible. They go to campus because they can't do it from home and they do want that experience. And now with the sudden switch, it isn't an option. That's why you still have 500 people moving back to, to campus this year with only 0.01%, literally 0.01% of courses being back in person. Um, so I think that really speaks for itself when you have that many students needing, not just wanting to, but needing to come back to campus to access those tools, even if it's just broadband, um, broadband Wi-Fi. Um, and then you have the other challenge for international students between the mix of synchronous and asynchronous learning. If you're an international student that's still studying in your country of origin, a class that's from 1 to 2.30 here is uh, 4 a.m. in another part of the world. So I think that asynchronous learning um, is not available to, to those students. Thank you very much for sharing. And, and to put Shamal on the spot, I'm so sorry. I know you're an international student. I mean, Obviously, you're in Canada right now and it's a different setup, but I'm curious to ask you a direct question. I mean, if you did not have the opportunity to study physically in Canada, would you have decided to pursue education elsewhere? Um, I was actually thinking of going back home for this semester. And I know that a lot of my other international student friends were thinking, but in the end, we decided not to. And it is mostly because what Malik just talked about, the um, time difference is very brutal. Um, we have so many courses and like they all run on like different times. Like some of them are in the morning, some of them are in the evening. And that just does not work when you 
try to do that in another country in a different time zone. And um, that's why a lot of students, a lot of international students ended up staying here, even though the cost of living here is a lot more expensive. They have to work many jobs to, you know, um, sustain themselves and uh, pay for the ridiculously expensive tuition fees. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, most of my international student friends did not choose to go back home, even though they haven't seen their friends or families for a long time. Um, it's because also um, if the whole pandemic situation goes bad again, if the countries go into lockdown again, um, they are not going to be able to come back for the most part. And that is a very challenging situation. So even though it's a bit hard to stay here too, for the sake of the, the consistency of the, the class schedules and you know, not having to take classes at 4 a.m. in the morning, most of us decided to stay here. Well, I'm selfishly very happy you decided to stay here because you've been a great asset for us in the SXD lab based on your feedback so far. So, <laughs> so this is very enlightening, actually. And I have a simple follow-up question for everyone. What can be better specific to remote teaching and learning? One thing that I've I've seen just from, from the courses that I've taken is that um, with online courses, uh, the level of support can actually be either um, scarce or it can be even more, uh, more present. So, and what I mean by that is that if these online courses have an, a built-in learning portal, you know, if they have multiple TAs or multiple students who are involved in that course, who are who are there to actually, you know, to to, to offer uh, feedback or or help, it is much more easier for you know students to use social networks or or to use the the application in question to get in touch with those people because now that everyone's at home people are actually much more more flexible with their time that that's what i've seen thank you for sharing malik your, your hand is raised yeah absolutely and i think ali brought this up but student feedback is incredibly important i think a lot of institutions are, are just using the tools that they have which is fair but do not actually look for for what the student needs for that improved education and that's why you asking this question on this platform is amazing, but institutions really need to understand what do students at their specific institution require to have that better, um, that better quality of education. I think another thing, and like I mentioned before, is that experiential learning, um, you know, those opportunities, especially in a virtual setting, because realistically, this could be our way of life and our, our employment um, culture for a long time. And I think that working virtually it won't be um, something we will just drop once COVID is over. I think that uh, students need to be prepared, and I think businesses need the tools as well to uh, to adapt to those incoming students uh, having internships or co-op placements at their place of business. Very good point. Very good point. Brad, your hand is raised. Uh, just to answer the question of um, what could be better from our teaching I realize it's really difficult because the universities are so large, but I know a real common frustration with students is the lack of uniformity. So I think if there was uh, an ability to kind of come up with, we're going to mainly stick to asynchronous, figure out the platforms. I know um, I have some students I work with that have three different platforms they're regularly having to log into. So that's kind of a difficulty. And I think um, the more that there's uniformity that they can achieve, in kind of planning out how they're going to structure courses, I think that make the delivery a lot smoother for students. Thank you for sharing, Brad. Shimon. Yeah, so um, in terms of what can be better as well, I think professors play a very, very important role in how students feel about their classes, as well as like program coordinators of uh, whatever program that you're in. It is, I think, very important that professors are as attentive as possible to students' needs and how they can improve a specific class instead of, you know, uh, focusing on like a program or just like all classes. 
as like a whole, it is very important to just like pinpoint what exactly can be changed or what exactly can be improved for that specific class. Um, for me, I've been blessed with like two amazing professors, Michael Bertuzzi and Dorothy Ward from School of Hospitality. They're really great. And what they do is they're very, very attentive. Like I said, they're, they're always sending out emails just to check us, uh, check up on us. Um, and they're always asking for feedback, like how is this class and like how this class can be improved? What, uh, how do you want to connect? What changes do you want to see? Um, so these questions are really, really important. And on top of that, um, I don't know about universities, but in colleges, there's a wide uh, area of, um, or a wide population of like uh, age groups. So there are Gen Z students, there are Gen X students, there are a lot of uh, older students as well who are not as literate uh, in like digital learning. So as a Gen Z, I'm just really like, it's so easy for me to you know, navigate through like the school platforms, the Zoom, uh, all of that stuff. But I do have a lot of other friends who don't have the time or the ability to, you know, learn exactly how they can make the most use of their um, digital spaces. So I think one thing that schools can, you know, focus on is try to sort of um, uh, sort of like create a, a resource pool to like help those type of students to um understand what they can achieve with these digital resources because there's a lot of things like more than just zoom or your school's um online platform there are a lot of things that can help you plan out your like uh school schedule etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think it's very important for schools to sort of focus on improving the digital learning experience for certain students thank you for sharing i mean you're absolutely right for for those that are not super familiar with you know, technology-enabled teaching and learning. It's definitely a steep learning curve. And I think, Malik, you made the point earlier that, like, really empathy is required, like understanding and just accommodations in these this new environment, for sure. Ali, your virtual hand is raised. Back when I also worked as a peer mentor at the University of Toronto, many of the, the issues that I noticed there to do with you know, students who wanted to seek out accessibility um, help was that there was, well, one, there was a social stigma with going to the, the office or being seen with going to to uh, going to, to seek help. And there was also the 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 just there were certain issues about, you know, how do I actually hear about this? I I didn't even know that th that this was actually a service. And um, one thing that I will note is that the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario did recently publish a research report on accessibility and the transition to remote learning. And one of the data points in that report points to that if you had two groups, one was students who I identified with having a disability and students who did not was that their experiences in both the, the in-person and the online classes pre-pandemic were relatively similar with regards to knowing where to seek out help and counseling. But during the pandemic, whereas yes, for the students who did not have a disability, their confidence in knowing where to find that support did drop. That that drop in confidence was much greater with, with students with disabilities based on the survey pool of re respondents, of course. And so then what this suggests is that the, the cracks that, that, that students with disabilities fall through pre-pandemic have now been amplified. And you know, we have to do more work to, to find out, you know, how can we actually, you know strive to bring it back to those pre-pandemic levels of support, or at least, you know, do our best. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much for sharing, Ali. Brad, if my memory serves me correctly, you actually contributed to that report, I believe, with HECO. I was uh, an external reviewer, so at the same right. data, I looked with Ali. Um, what's interesting about the accessibility need, because there definitely is a barrier of stigma 
there is a bit of an opportunity for an advantage with everything being moved online. And it's actually interesting because we're, we're still trying to figure out how to get people engaged in our workshops that we're doing. In the summer, they launched something called a, a virtual accountability check-in. And the attendance was really great where we're having large portions of students show up every week, setting goals on a Monday. And then there's also a Friday session to kind of like evaluate how their weeks went. So I think there is um, definitely these students, when everything shifted, you have an accessibility need, it's going to be amplified because there's more things to deal with. But um, there is a kind of a neat opportunity with some of the remote teaching and going forward, I think, of being able to meet the needs of these students. So one thing I would like to talk about is community. I mean, community is often an important aspect of any college or university experience. And, and let's be real here. For some students, their motivation to attend post-secondary is driven by a desire to have that traditional face-to-face -face social experience. So from your perspectives, how can we establish community that runs alongside formal learning that perhaps replicates but does not replace the social experience of campus life? Shimon, your hand is up. So one thing that I've been um, observing um, since this semester has started was um, my school personally, Centennial College, has helped with you know first year students, first semester students to sort of um, get to know some people, you know, um, sort of like they did some sort of a virtual orientation, but um, for the students who are specifically seeking that, you know, social interaction, social connection aspect of post-secondary education, it's kind of hard to like get that same feeling through Zoom, unfortunately. Um, from uh, institution side, I haven't really seen a lot of community engagement stuff, uh, to be quite honest. Everything was done on an individual basis. Uh, currently, I'm in so many WhatsApp and Facebook groups that I've ever been in. Like there's so many of these groups and that is because we as students decided to take on this and sort of create these groups to sort of still get connected outside of Zoom classes. And um, what we were planning to do uh, before the second wave was just a group of like three to five students go meet up at a park or a backyard and sort of just like create like small classes in our like little social bubble. But again, this was also an individual um, decision uh, from the students, not from an institution uh, level. Uh, what I know Centennial does is that they're uh, very active on their Instagram. They're doing a lot of surveys to understand where the students are coming from, like how they're feeling about this, um, this whole shift to the online education. So they're trying to understand how students are feeling, but I realize that they're lacking um, some community engagement in that. And to be quite honest, there isn't much to do right now, especially now that we're going like slowly going into the whole, you know, second phase thing. Um, the only thing that I and most of my classmates can think of is uh, school should try to um, organize a lot more virtual community engagement things, um, such as, you know, virtual paint nights, virtual movie nights. I've known that different communities do certain things. You know how the first couple months of quarantine, everybody was on Zoom calls, you know, doing Zoom parties, all of that stuff. So in a virtual learning situation, there is really not much to do other than just, you know, making the most use of Zoom calls and trying to um, create those sort of like online safe spaces for mostly for first year students because it's uh, it's a bit challenging for them um, compared to like me as a third year student or like a second year student because they still have some friends, right? But first year students are just in this whole thing without knowing what's going to happen. And it is really, really important for them to like try to connect in a way that makes them feel safe and at the same time connected. Very, very good points. Thank you for sharing, Shamal. Malik, your hand is up. Yeah, I think I think Shamal um, really said it well. Like, I think the make or break for a lot of first year students, especially to to go to to pursue post secondary education this year or not, is that social aspect. I mean, if this happened last year, like I would have been on pretty much on the fence as well, probably. 
maybe not, but um, but um, but I think when we talk about you know offering virtual tour uh, tools to institutions, we only think about the academic side and not really that student life aspect. So you know, I think a lot of institutions have some amazing clubs and amazing student groups, but they don't get the same attention that like those um, those academic bodies do in terms of offering like portals or study spaces or virtual study spaces or anything. And that's really up to the students, um, which I think is, is, is lacks that, that, that balance that we see. And I think too, like Laurentian, for example, is a, has a tricultural mandate and, 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 and pursues that very, um, very heavily, but does not offer those online tools to those indigenous groups, those francophone groups, uh, whatever other cultural groups that, that really need it right now especially for those international students that feel pretty isolated right now, like we talked about before. Um, I think that there just needs to be a lot more resources given to those groups um, at, since, since pretty much now that academic portion is pretty well established in the virtual space right now. You know, especially, you know, winter's approaching, there's not going to be a lot more stuff to do outside. Not a, like if there were any sort of community involvement you could do before, that's going to be totally eliminated in like probably a week, two weeks in Sudbury. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I, I think just keeping all that in mind is super important. And also just the, um, the marketing behind it. Like a lot of institutions have those uh, free counseling services or just like other services that are available to students, even online, but that are but students don't even are not even aware of that when they need those services now more than ever, uh, and that goes for for anyone in the post secondary sector from those professors that are really stressed about about um, you know juggling all these things and to the students that are really still questioning a lot of their their uh, academic career right now. Definitely, definitely. Good, really good points, Malik. Thank you for sharing this. Ali, your hand is up. One thing that I've seen that is uh, quite successful is that while it's not quite social, it still does give a chance for students to to network, and that is that is that. So whether it's uh, you know ha having meetings with learning strategists, career counselors, or having it in a much larger forums such as a meet and greet with certain companies or stuff like that there is a much more of a chance to do that now that that i've seen and with regards to meetups or um program reunions from the few that i've been in those work quite well when you know it's not just 50 people all on one screen that, that there are breakout rooms with facilitators and that there is some sort of you know overall goal and not just casual conversation because those tend to you know go all over the place and then uh, die out so absolutely so there's going to be a lot of educators viewing this panel discussion. And on the same lines of what can be better, I mean, what advice do you have for educators to better support your learning journey? I mean, how can they make your life easier? Shamal? Um, I think when a lot of people think about international students, they think about just, you know, money machines. Um, like, uh, uh, like, you know, rich students who have a lot of money and like they live in like large condos and stuff like that. But the reality is that's just like a very little chunk of the international students that study in Canada right now. Um, I don't have any international student friends who are rich. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and that is a big concern for all of us because right now most of us needs to like work on a couple jobs to like pay rent, pay the tuition fees. Uh, and the other challenging aspect of it is that um, we're not able to see our friends or families for so long. And that puts on a lot of emotional strain on us as well. And uh, like Malik said earlier, um, mental health resources are very, very important in that sense. And I think it is important for generally for uh, professors, uh, you know, success advisors, or even deans to, you know, understand where uh, international students are coming from, where their concerns are coming from, 
and why they might not be the most, you know, um, attentive during classes, why they might not be the most, you know, um, responsive, et cetera, et cetera. So it is important to understand their aspects and understand their struggles and sort of um, understand that school is probably not the only thing that international students are struggling with. There is a lot of different uh, aspects in their background that is probably stressing them out. And it is very, very important for professors to um, always keep that in mind. I think Centennial College does a great job with that because we have a big population of international students. So the understanding of that is very much, you know, concrete at this point at Centennial College. Uh, but it's uh, always like a good thing for international students to uh, feel that they're being supported and they're being um, under understood in whatever they're doing. Thank you very much for sharing, Shamal. I mean, you're right, especially for the international student perspective, like there's so many other layers of complexity. And I mean, it all comes back to empathy from my perspective, like we educators and, and all parties involved to support your learning journey need to just be understanding that this is just a new environment with new challenges and pain points. And yeah, thank you for sharing though. Malik, your hand is up. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you, you're kind of, you said pretty much uh, what I'm going to be saying, but I think just to sum this up in three points for those educators watching, uh, I think one is to be empathetic of, uh, of different students. Everyone is going through something different, uh, you know, as I'm sure many educators are as well. Second is to continue learning about different perspectives and different challenges that students face. I think there are an abundance of different perspectives that every institution will face. And I think it's important to constantly be aware of those as we're teaching, just to not alienate anyone or not to make someone feel like, you know, their perspective isn't valid. And then third is to just be creative, think creatively. I think uh, things change almost every day now. Uh, 2020 keeps surprising me. But, you know, there's always new tools, there's always something different uh, happening and every course, every program needs to be tailored differently and professors learning style as well as the needs of students will change. So I think that um, to always be in mind that there is not one solution for, uh, for any academic problem. I think that, that a lot of creative thinking needs to happen uh, throughout the next few months. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's it's definitely a trying time and it's really important, I think, for educators to be flexible and even for students as well. It's a two-way streak, but to just have flexibility and empathy front and center. And, and I mean, I think in terms of what educators can do from my perspective of operating the SXD lab, I mean, talk to students, learn from them what's working, what's not and what could be better and just, just be empathetic to all of that. Ali or uh, Brad, would you like to close off with any thoughts at all? Brad, your hand is raised, your virtual hand. I'm uh, echoing a few things that Samal and Alex said. I really do agree about, again, being open to feedback and change and realizing that it's a trying time. I agree, there's not one solution that's gonna work, but pulling your students, listening to the feedback and then integrating that, and then realizing too, there is a lot of um, great support services, whether that's accessibility services or registered study groups that U of T just recently launched that are available. But I think a lot of students might not necessarily know about it. So if there's an onus on educators to be able to communicate those programs to students, that would be really great to get, um, again, get those resources to them. Well, I want to thank you all for taking the time to share your perspectives and kind of dig deep on some of your experiences in terms of what's working and what's not and, and always what could be better. And yeah, really appreciate you spending the time to share back with our community at TESS. Um, they're going to be very eager to learn from you. And, and I think the advice that I'm gathering from all of you and, and certainly from my perspective with the SXD lab, the unsolicited advice is just talk to students and, and learn from them and try to understand their challenges so that you can accommodate them and, and be flexible and empathetic to this new environment. But thank you all, Brad, Malik, Ali, and Shamal. It was really great hearing from you.